figures in the cryptocurrency world can be very volatile. So Bitcoins at some point were valued at around uh, $69,000. That's sort of their peak in around November of 2021. Right now, they're somewhere in the range of twenty to $25,000. Um, so they they sort of swing pretty wide, wildly, and there's a very sort of popular speculative market around them. And then finally, there are these things called smart contracts, which are basically just software that runs on the blockchain. Um, if you are familiar at all with Excel, if you think of the blockchain as the Excel spreadsheet, the smart contracts are kind of like the Excel macros that can sort of run operations on that database. So hopefully that's enough to just sort of level set a little bit. I don't want to go into too much detail because this is more about sort of the ethics of blockchains versus the technology of them. But if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt uh, or ask at the end of the session when we'll have a time for Q&A. Oh, sorry. Um, so there is kind of a few layers to the blockchain ecosystem to some extent. At the very base, there's the blockchains themselves. On top of that are the cryptocurrencies and the smart contracts, which are sort of how you actually accomplish anything with a blockchain. And then on top of that is this third layer of all of the different things that people build um, using these instruments. And the top layer is very broad. It, it could be anything. So there's these things called dApps, which is short for decentralized apps. It's basically any application that is running on these sort of decentralized services. There are DAOs, if you've heard of those, which is basically a, a, a group of people who uh, you know, govern their community using blockchains and smart contracts. And then there are centralized services. So like Coinbase, FTX, if you've heard of any of those names, those are centralized companies that build um, on top of this technology. And for today, I'm just gonna focus on sort of the lower two of these because I think it's more interesting to talk about some of the ethical questions that the technology itself raises. Plus the third layer is incredibly broad. I mean, people are doing just about anything you can imagine on the blockchain. And so it'd be tough to sort of go into that in too much detail. So the goals of blockchains, some people would call these characteristics of blockchains. I would say they're more goals because various blockchains achieve these to sort of varying degrees. Um, but the goal is for them to be decentralized, trustless, transparent, um, pseudonymous, and immutable. Um, and like I said, there are a lot of different blockchains out there. So there's the Bitcoin blockchain, there's the Ethereum blockchain, there's Solana, Polygon. I mean, there's like thousands of them. And they often operate in somewhat different ways. And so um, some of them, for example, are very centralized. There's like one company that's running the blockchain and they run most of the nodes. Um, and then sort of on the other extreme, there are some that are very decentralized and there's not actually that much in terms of centralized control. So these are really the goals and sort of the ideology behind the blockchain technology. Um, but it's important to remember in practice that this can vary to some extent um, how much these things actually apply. So we'll go through these in order to some extent. Um, so decentralization in terms of a network um, should be distinguished to some extent from distributed or distributed networks. Um, and blockchains are often some amount of decentralized and distributed, but decentralized basically means that the nodes operate independently without any entity having control over the network as a whole. Whereas a distributed network refers more to processing being split across many nodes that are often like geographically distributed. So I like to make the comparison to say Amazon Web Services. If you're familiar, um, you know, you, if you wanna do cloud computing, you can open an account with Amazon. They'll give you access to their cloud servers and those are distributed. You know, they have data centers all over the world. There's many, you know, there's several of them in the US. They're, you know, kind of all over the place. Um, but most people would not refer to Amazon Web Services as decentralized because it is Amazon who is running all of those data centers. And even though they are spread out, they are sort of all controlled by that one entity. So the idea with blockchains is that they're supposed to be decentralized. It's, there shouldn't be one Amazon running all of these nodes that are maintaining the blockchain. It should be a bunch of very independent operators um, so that there isn't sort of this locus of control. Um, 
And so I have over on the right hand side, it's slightly covered by the Zoom thing. She put it here. Oh, I need a mouse pad. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, so I have this sort of spectrum on the right that will be throughout these slides. At the top, there are things that are basically benefits of this goal of, in this case, decentralization. At the bottom, there are risks that are introduced by that goal. And sometimes there are things that I've put in the middle, which are kind of both a risk and a benefit, depending on the context. So with decentralization, there are some benefits in that ideally, there's no one party that has control over the entire network. Um, so if, you know, for example, Amazon decided they didn't like what you were doing, too bad because there are all these other nodes that are operating there and, you know, you can rely on them. Um, it's also more resilient. So if, and, and this helps, this sort of it ties into the distributed side of things, but, you know, if there is a huge storm on the East Coast, Amazon Web Services East might go down, but luckily they have other data centers and might, your processing might be distributed across those. The same idea sort of holds true with blockchains where if there was some incident and a bunch of the nodes went offline, you'd still be able to rely on other nodes because it's a, you know, distributed network. The risk, however, or the sort of downside of this thing, these things is that it's slower, difficult to scale, and often higher cost. So it's pretty cheap to just have one database that's in a centralized location. You don't have to do a ton of work to do that. They're pretty efficient these days. Running a decentralized and distributed network is just pretty much always more expensive, slower, and it doesn't scale very well. So that's something that blockchains definitely run into a lot of the time. Um, you know. Bitcoin, for example, processes only a few transactions uh, every minute. And, you know, there are basically all of these layers that people are having to sort of tack on to a lot of the blockchains to provide a more reasonable amount of, you know, uh, throughput. So um, that's something that blockchains tend to run into in terms of problems. Moving on, um, there's this idea of trustlessness, which I think is pretty fascinating and definitely has some ethical considerations that you have to run into. It's a very sort of ideological idea. Um, so to go back in history a little bit, Bitcoin was created in sort of the 2008-2009 timeframe. And it was right around when um, there was this financial crisis in the US where banks were sort of in a tough spot. And it ended up spreading to sort of a more global phenomenon where there was this great financial crisis. Um, and Satoshi, who created the Bitcoin blockchain, was you know directly referenced the great financial crisis in his white paper as basically a reason why he didn't trust banks um, and believed that we needed this system that operated outside of central banks to allow people to transact. Um, and so that's sort of this idea of trustlessness, which is that there isn't, you don't have to trust your bank or your government or any particular entity in order to use a blockchain. Um, you just have to trust that the code is going to run the way that people say it does. Um, there's also this uh, secondary meaning of trustlessness, which is basically um, you know, the, the, the blockchain nodes can operate without necessarily having to trust that any individual node is a good actor. Um, so there are basically incentives in place in terms of the, uh, the way the network operates where it is just very difficult to basically attack the blockchain because of the structures that are in place. So some examples of, you know, where we see this trust in today's sort of financial system is you have to trust that, you know, if you go to an ATM and you put a hundred bucks in, Bank of America is gonna hold on to that hundred bucks for you. And anytime you wanna get it out, it's probably gonna be there and you can get it back. Um, there, you also trust in credit card companies these days where, you know, if you are making transactions using your credit card, um, that centralized credit card company is going to process your transactions for you. Um, they are not going to take more money than they said they would. They might reverse your transaction if there's fraud in, in, in the system. Um, and then there's trust in terms of services that you use online, for example. So if you're using a social network like Facebook or Twitter, 
and you are, you know, posting all your content on there, most people trust to some extent that that account will be there tomorrow. You won't be banned arbitrarily. But there are some people that really worry about that kind of centralized entity in the sense that Twitter could shut them down. Or for example, if you're a content creator who relies on like YouTube for income, you're putting a lot of trust in YouTube when you're building your platform there, that they're not going to cut you off from their platform. They're not gonna change the rules underneath you and sort of undermine your business model. Um, and so that's a source of worry for some people. So in terms of uh, the benefits of trustlessness, it gives people a high degree of control um, over their assets, for example. So it's kind of, you can sort of think of it as like holding on to cash. If you decide to take all of your money out of the bank and just hold on to it in cash, you have a lot of control over that, right? You can spend it anytime you want. You don't have to wait for the bank to open to give you your money back. Um, but on the other hand, there's also a really high degree of individual responsibility there. And so that's kind of in the middle and that that's a good thing in some ways. Some people really like to have, you know, sole control over all of their assets. But I think a lot of people, if they have any significant amount of money, they start to feel a little nervous, right? Like if they have that in cash, most people don't keep just like large amounts of money under their mattress, for example, um, because that's kind of a scary thing. What if there's a fire or someone breaks into your house or, you know, any number of things can go wrong. And so a lot of people like to trust centralized entities. Um, but, you know, in the sort of blockchain ideology, there is this uh, push and pull there where some people like to, it's called self-custodying their assets, where they are basically holding on to their Bitcoin themselves. They are the only ones who have access to those Bitcoins. Um, and they like having that level of control, but there's also this high degree of responsibility where they have to remember that password. And if they forget that password, that money is gone. And there's, you can't call up your bank and say, Hey, sorry, I forgot my password. Can you please help me out? There, you, it's gone. And so um, there are some problems that sort of arise in there sometimes. And to some extent, there have been um, moves to introduce more trust into blockchain-based uh, systems. So for example, there's uh, centralized exchanges like Coinbase, for example, or, or FTX was one of them. There's Binance, there's a whole bunch of different ones. But with those, there's sort of a level of um, user experience like you might expect with a bank. So if I buy a bunch of Bitcoins and I'm holding them on Coinbase and I forget my password, like I can still kind of talk to Coinbase and get that figured out. And there's, you know, there's a level of um, security in that sense. But I'm also putting a lot of trust in Coinbase that the company's not going to suddenly go bankrupt and all of my coins are no longer accessible to me, as happened with FTX, for example. Um, and so it's a little bit of a controversial thing within the blockchain sort of ethos because some people believe that you should never, you know, give up access to your coins in that way. And then again, there are sacrifices in terms of efficiency, cost, and also services. So for example, um, you don't get those services that you might get with a bank. Um, so like I mentioned, there's this sort of security and account access issue where you know, with your bank, you can probably walk into a branch and say, hey, I forgot my password to my online account. Can you help me reset it? And they'll verify who you are. And then, you know, things will kind of work out. There is no version of that um, with Bitcoin or the other various blockchains. Um, and then there's like services that those centralized intermediaries provide uh, that I think are pretty useful. Some people might disagree, I guess. But, you know, I kind of like that if I have a credit card and something goes wrong, you know, I use a sketchy ATM or I, I try to order something off a website that maybe isn't quite so um, secure and someone steals my credit card number, I can probably get the transaction reversed. My bank is going to step in and say, okay, there was fraud here. Um, with Bitcoin, there is no version of that. So if your, you know, Bitcoin wallet gets hacked and someone takes all your Bitcoins, they're gone. There's no, you know, customer service line to call. And so there are some sort of um, considerations that I think blockchain companies really have to take into, you know, keep in mind when they're building on these systems, which is that a lot of people have really come to expect that financial services companies will operate in the way that, you know, banks, credit card companies operate. And it is um, interesting to see in this industry when something goes wrong at one of those companies, there will often be a lot of people who use those services who said, I didn't even know that could happen. Like I didn't know that my Bitcoins could all be stolen and you know, there was no one who could reverse that. 
Um, and so, you know, there, there's this sort of messaging problem, I think, that has be become kind of rampant in the industry where the less sophisticated users who aren't, you know, very familiar with how, um, you know, blockchains and cryptocurrencies work, sometimes end up expecting things that aren't necessarily true. And I think to some extent, a lot of the companies that operate in this space kind of take advantage of that, where um, they will sort of position themselves as though they were a bank or, you know, a very, you know, uh, traditional financial services company. And then when something goes wrong, you know, they're like, well, sorry, you know, we're using the blockchain, we can't undo it. Um, which I think, again, touches on some of the ethical problems here. I think, you know, just being very clear about the technology that you're providing, the services that you're providing is very critical in the technology world. And it's something that I think has been somewhat lacking uh, in the cryptocurrency industry. All right, um, so another sort of characteristic goal of blockchains is this idea of transparency. And so again, this is something that can differ between blockchains to some extent, um, but with Bitcoin, Ethereum, a lot of these major blockchains, everything is completely public. So this screenshot is from a service called Etherscan, but you can take anyone's Ethereum wallet address, plug it into this thing, and you can see every transaction they've ever made. Um, if you want to make a comparison to tra traditional finance, it's kind of as though my entire credit card transaction history was just out there for anyone to look up if they wanted to, um, which I think you know sort of introduces some questions around um, you know how we uh, you know, think of these things and how we are, um, you know, operating with the cryptocurrencies, um, in the sense that, you know, there are some people who envision this future where cryptocurrency is the form of currency. And, you know, you buy a gallon of milk and you use your Bitcoin wallet or, you know, pick your, pick your crypto. Um, you know, you pay your rent in this, you pay your mortgage in this, you pay your student loans in this. Um, and there's a lot of privacy issues, I think, that come up when you start to think about something like that. Um, so one thing, I'll touch on this in the next slide, but you'll notice that there isn't like a name here. So it's not like, oh, this is Molly White's crypto wallet. There is this blockchain address, or that's the transaction hash. Yeah, the sort of middle uh, slide or column there. Um, shows this sort of semi-random string of characters. And so there is some obfuscation and in, the, in the sense that if you keep that really private, people might not be able to follow all of your transactions. But, you know, there is um, a risk that if someone is able to connect that address to you, your entire transaction history is public and people can do with that data as they please. Um, so this is good in some ways. So it provides a level of, say, auditability. Some people really like the idea that, you know, if there is a company that is using blockchains, you can confirm that they're doing all they say they did because, you know, they these transactions are public. You can see that they're spending the money in the way you expected. Um, but, you know, there's really pros and cons of having open data. So, you know, I think open data can be a very good thing. You know, being able to reuse data is great. Um, having access to data to be able to analyze it can be great. Um, but when you think about what this data is, you know, there's kind of some downsides there as well. So, for example, um, I'm sure some of you have experienced being, you know, uh, receiving targeted marketing where you buy something and then suddenly you get all these ads for sort of related things. Or, you know, you Google something and now you're, everyone's trying to sell you the thing that you Googled. Um, you can sort of imagine what might happen if, you know, the, the history that they're working off of is even more public than it is today. So right now, you know, it's not very well, you know, there isn't a whole lot of privacy. You can buy that data from data brokers, but having it completely public, I think, would be kind of a... Um, major change in terms of, you know, how people are able to use that data. Um, and if you think about some of the data that could be on here in terms of like student loan data or, you know, any other major transactions that you're making, you know, your rent payments, um, anyone could see if you're late on your student loan payment or your rent, um, you know, they can make judgments about you on, based on that. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of sort of ethical concerns around making that kind of data public. 
Um, like I said, I, I don't want to sort of ignore the fact there are some blockchains that try to handle this to some extent. They're not very popular today, um, mostly because the less transparency there is in these sort of pseudonymous systems, the more potential there can be for crime and money laundering. And so it is very difficult to find um, exchanges, for example, that will accept some of these more private coins and transfer them into, say, US dollars, because they tend to be heavily used for cybercrime. Um, all right, and then sort of down on the risk end of things. Um, so there's no access control for private data. So if we're starting to talk about blockchains that include more data than just, um, you know, transaction information, and they're actually storing, you know, user con uh, created data or records about people, for example, there is no access control. Um, so people start to talk about, well, we'll just encrypt the data and put it on the public chain, which definitely is a step in the right direction. But typically when you're trying to keep data very private, you both want to encrypt it and also introduce access controls so that people aren't able to you know, access that information and then say, try to crack the encryption or, or whatever it might be. Um, and then, like I said, there are privacy issues that you have to consider. And then there's also just the abuse potential. So, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, in this sort of future world that some people envision around everything is on the chain. Um, you know, if you were to go buy a gallon of milk at the corner store and people knew that was your blockchain address, they could probably make some inferences that you might live near that corner store, for example. Or if you're paying your rent or your mortgage and it's able, you know, you're able to see that that um, property management company is based in Boston, then people might be able to make inferences about that. Um, if you're paying for a therapist or, you know, like uh, a more uh, a service that might be somewhat, um, I guess people might be able to make judgments about you because of that service, you know, a substance abuse counselor or something like that, you know, there are some um, privacy implications that really I think need to be considered. All right, so I touched on this a little bit, but there's this pseudonymity aspect of things where, um, it's not necessarily saying, okay, this is Molly White and this is her blockchain address, but there's this ID that sort of stands in for me. So it's different from anonymous, which um, would sort of, every transaction would be distinct and you wouldn't necessarily be able to tie them back to the same person. In this case, all the transactions are there as if it was just one entity and it's just, a, there's a pseudonym instead of my name. Um, so this is good in some senses in that it can enable privacy. So you know, when you open a bank account, there is no option to open a bank account without telling the bank who you are. You have to give them your ID. You have to prove who you, your identity to some extent. With a crypto address, you can create a crypto address that has no ties to your real name, your real identity. Um, and that can be good in terms of, um, you know, reducing the level of financial surveillance that is currently in the financial system. Um, but it also has some downsides in that sometimes there are reasons that we want to know who is transacting with uh, currency. So in terms of money laundering, for example, or cybercrime, it can be difficult for um, those things to be, you know, prosecuted just because there is this extra step where, you know, law enforcement or whichever entity needs to figure out who is actually behind these wallets. Um, it is becoming, I think, maybe a little bit easier for governments and law enforcement agencies to do that. Um, there's sort of been this blossoming industry of chain analysis tools that will allow um, inferences to be made about who might be controlling multiple wallets. Um, and, you know, people can still, or governments can still subpoena some of these centralized exchanges. So if one of these addresses interacts with those exchanges and they've had to identify themselves to the exchange, then the identity can be um, discovered that way. But there is at least theoretically this level of privacy that is introduced via that method. Um, one downside is that ID verification can be difficult when it is needed. So there's obviously the government law enforcement side of things that I just referred to, but there are also some cases where in these blockchain-based systems, you want to know that a person, a real you know, human being is in control of a wallet address. I think a good example is with NFTs. So if you're familiar with NFTs at all, people will often create artwork and then mint it as an NFT, and then they can sell it to whichever audience they like. 
Um, and typically, if there is a well-known artist, you kind of want to know that that is the artist who is selling those NFTs, because I could just download their artwork, make it into an NFT and try to start selling it. But, you know, that's not something that most people would want to support. They want to actually pay the real artist behind it. Um, and so it can be difficult to prove identity without introducing these centralized or trusted third parties, um, thanks to the sort of uh, way that the chain is created. Um, there's also widespread misunderstandings, I would say, about the extent of privacy. So this gets back to what I was talking about earlier, where I think uh, companies in this space need to be very clear about what they are providing. But a lot of people really do believe that if you are transacting with Bitcoin or Ethereum or whichever, it is anonymous and that it can't be traced to them, which, like I said, especially with the advent of a lot of these chain analysis tools, is no longer the case. Um, and so some people end up having, you know, doing transactions with cryptocurrencies and not realizing that A, they can be tied back to them, and B, the whole transaction history is public. Um, so I think that's another thing that needs to be very clear when you are sort of providing these services to people. All right, and then the last one is immutability. So the idea with a blockchain is once a block has been added and it forms a part of the chain, um, it can't be changed or removed. Um, and so this can be good in some cases. Um, you know, blockchain advocates will often talk about censorship resistance. So you know, there is no one saying that you can't make a transaction. And once that transaction is made, there's no one who can intervene and undo that transaction. Um, it's resistant to some kinds of fraud in terms of um, fraud that would involve tampering with that data after the fact. It's not resistant to all types of fraud. It's very sort of specific types of fraud. Um, but if there was any sort of, um, you know, if, if you were planning to pay someone for a good or a service, you paid them, they gave you the good or service, you couldn't do the type of fraud that would, you know, involve going back and erasing that that ever happened and then being able to spend that money again, which is known as the double spending problem um, in crypto. Um, and so this, you know, restricts people from doing things like chargeback fraud, which is something that people who process credit cards often worry about, which is, you know, kind of exactly what I said. Someone pays for something with their credit card, they receive the service or good that you're selling to them, and then they do a chargeback. They ask their, you know, credit card company to reverse that transaction. You lose the money and you've also given them the thing that you, you know, thought you were selling them. Um, data can't be removed even years later. So, you know, Bitcoin, for example, first started operating in 2009 or so. Every single transaction that has happened on the Bitcoin blockchain is still available for anyone to see even now, you know, over a decade later. Um, this is good and bad. So sometimes it's good to be able to transact or trace transactions, you know, pretty far back in history. But to some extent, you know, sometimes people want to remove things that they put on the internet. Um, so when it comes to transactions, you know, that's a fairly small problem set, you know, that's a very specific type of data, but when we broaden things into these other blockchains that are storing much more, um, you know, uh, variable types of data that's beyond just transactions, you know, you can imagine a world in which you wanted to take something down, and that's really just not feasible when it comes to blockchains. Um, as I mentioned, transactions can't be undone. That's a good thing and a bad thing. So, you know, there's the chargeback fraud case. There's also the case where someone actually scammed you, you know, and you want to be able to undo that transaction. And that's, again, just not possible thanks to the way the technology is built. Um, another thing, sort of touching back on that perception issue, there's widespread misunderstandings around the data, of na uh, the nature of data integrity. So there's often this idea that blockchains are secure and the data is um, reliable. And that's true to some extent. So the data is, is reliable in the sense that when you write something to the chain, you can rely on the fact that that data won't have changed, you know, a year later when you go back to look at it again. It doesn't necessarily mean that the data that was written to the chain was accurate in the first place. So there's kind of this idea of the garbage in, garbage out problem, which is that, you know, if you write something to the chain that is false to begin with, and people believe that they can rely on that because blockchains are reliable, there's a misunderstanding there. And so people sometimes believe that data integrity on the blockchain is sort of just a given as though there's someone actually verifying the data that's being placed on the chain to begin with. 
Um, and then there's a downside in that erroneous data can't be simply corrected. So if you, you know, put something on the chain, it's incorrect. You can't go back in and edit that so that it is correct. You can only sort of make a new transaction to say, ignore that last one. This is the right data now. Um, and that can introduce some problems in some cases. All right, so we've gotten past sort of the blockchain um, characteristics, goals, whatever you want to call them. Just going to quickly touch on cryptocurrency and smart contracts before we go into some sort of case studies around some ethical questions that often arise. So cryptocurrency, like I said, is the actual token that people believe has some amount of value. And it's used both to incentivize maintaining the network in the sense that it is provided to, say, Bitcoin miners as a reward. Um, but there's also the secondary market where people like to buy and sell it for basically uh, speculative purposes. So, you know, if you want, you know, if, if Bitcoin is worth $20,000 today and you think that next year it's going to be worth $100,000, you might buy a bunch of it, hold on to it, and hope that it appreciates over time. Um, like I said, cryptocurrency is very volatile. So compared to other asset classes, it is one of the more volatile ones compared to, say, stocks in the stock market. Although obviously there are exceptions there where some of those are very volatile too. But um, you know, generally speaking, cryptocurrency is a pretty volatile asset. That's both good and bad. So a volatile asset means you can make huge returns on it, right? If something goes up you know, $20,000 to $100,000, that's great for you if you bought in at $20,000. But the problem is it can also go in the reverse. So if you buy in at $100,000 and it goes back to $20,000, you've just lost a lot of money. Um, I think the volatility is sometimes underestimated by sort of the average consumer who sees Bitcoins as an asset class and they're like, yeah, kind of like the stock market. And they're not used to the like thousand percent, 10,000 percent swings that you sometimes see in the crypto market. And so there is this danger where people will sometimes invest in cryptocurrencies, not realizing that there is just an enormous amount of risk there. Um, there's also susceptibility to theft and loss. So, you know, if you go and buy it, a share of Apple stock, chances are you're still going to have that share of Apple stock next year. And it might be worth less or more, who knows, but you know, that's sort of a risk that you accept when you get involved in the stock market. With crypto, there is this sort of added risk that, you know, that currency might not exist in a year. Um, with some of the major currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, you can probably assume that that will be around, but there are something like 25,000 different cryptocurrencies listed on a major crypto tracker. Those are even the ones that, you know, meet the criteria to list. There's far more than that that just exists and are not listed. Um, and some of those, many of those just sort of cease to exist over a period of time when people lose interest. Um, there's also the risk that you might lose those, uh, Bitcoins, Ethereum, whatever it might be, based on how you choose to hang on to them. So like I said, there's that self-custody option where you actually have to make sure that you're, you know, responsibly keeping control of your wallet. Or there are, you know, people who choose to trust in these third-party custodians. And, you know, especially over the last year or so have learned that in some cases that isn't such a good option. So people who had their cryptocurrency in the FTX crypto exchange are currently waiting for bankruptcy proceedings to play out. And at some point in the future, we'll learn, you know, how much of their assets they might get access to. It'll probably be less than, you know, 100 cents on the dollar, but hopefully they'll get some amount of those in return. Um, and there was, have been kind of a slew of bankruptcies over the past year where custodians have gone bankrupt and people who had accounts with those exchanges have said things that, you know, basically to the effect of, I knew that Bitcoin might go up or down in value. I, I accepted that risk. I did not realize that you know my bank wouldn't just give me my bitcoins back if something went wrong. And then there's this issue around um, regulation. So at least in the U.S., there's really not a whole lot of regulation being applied to these um, companies that are operating in this space and the projects that are operating in this space. And so it can be difficult for sort of the average consumer to figure out whether or not they can trust a given project or not and to evaluate that project. There's a lot of very sort of technical um, evaluation that people find themselves having to do, you know, reading the code to make sure that there isn't some backdoor where the project's creators could take all the money and run, that type of thing. There is no sort of regulatory body that is adding some layer of trust where it's like, okay, someone has signed off on this project, you know, they probably aren't gonna steal all my money and run off to a non-extradition country. 
And then finally, there's this issue around environmental damage. Um, so this is some information about the Bitcoin blockchain in specific. Um, Bitcoin uses a very specific consensus algorithm that is incredibly um, energy inefficient, I guess. So um, as you can see from this, it uses about the same amount of energy as like the Philippines. So Bitcoin is like ranking among entire sort of small to medium sized countries in terms of the energy use that is um, sort of consuming every year as far as, and as well as like carbon footprint and electronic waste as well. Um, so the computation that actually allows people to maintain the Bitcoin network is, you know, it requires these huge sort of mining operations that often set up by, you know, natural gas uh, sources or hydroelectric um, in order to do a ton of computation. And that can be, again, really environmentally damaging. I will say that there are a lot of blockchains that are far more energy efficient. So um, if anyone's familiar with Ethereum, they recently went through something called the merge where um, they switched from using a consensus algorithm that was similar to Bitcoin's and was similarly environmentally damaging to one that it is far more, you know, eco-friendly and is more on the realm of like cloud computing, which, you know, I think most people will accept is uses some electricity, but it's not countries worth. So it's something that you have to keep in mind to some extent where, you know, there was a period of time where companies were considering building, you know, <clears throat> using the Ethereum chain and they had to decide, you know, are we willing to also accept the amount of, you know, energy waste that is going into this? And some companies ended up experiencing some reputational damage where there were some, you know, they had sort of set themselves out to be a very green company, a very eco-friendly company. And then they launched NFTs on Ethereum or something like that. And people were like, what are you doing? You know, this is not aligning with your values. Okay, so finally, there's this idea of smart contracts. So a very sort of simple example here is you could set up a smart contract that was basically like a bet where I would say, I'll give you $100 if, what did I say? If Northeastern wins against BU in the bean pot. Um, and the smart contract would automatically execute that transaction if those conditions were met. So, you know, we wait, it's the bean pot, Northeastern wins, and you send me, I guess, $100 in this case. I couldn't remember which direction I made it. Um, but there are some sort of questions that come into play when you're creating contracts like this in the sense that they are very trustworthy and reliable if all of the data exists on chain to begin with. But as soon as you have to bring in external data, like, for example, who won the bean pot, um, then you have to trust somebody. So this is no longer really like a trustless operation. You have to decide that somebody will reliably put into this contract that, oh, Northeastern actually won. You know, there's no way for the blockchain blockchain to just sort of know that. There has to be some external data source there. And then you have to be very careful about how you write these things. So the fact that, you know, this is encoded in the blockchain, it automatically executes that $100 has been locked up. Um, what if there is some edge case that you didn't consider? So what if Northeastern or BU doesn't make it to the championship and it's two other teams that are playing? What happens to the bet? Like the bet can't really go on at that point. What if the game is canceled? You know, that's that happened during COVID where they canceled the bean pot one year. Um, if all of these possibilities aren't accounted for, you can end up with really unexpected behavior where, for example, the money is just locked in the smart contract and it can never be distributed to the participants in the bet because those conditions have never been met. Um, there's this idea of code is law that people will talk about where it's like, instead of having this whole system of contract law, we'll just replace everything with smart contracts. And then, um, you know, we, everything will just self-execute. We don't have to go to court all the time. It'll be wonderful. But um, many of the things that are involved in like contract law are really hard to reflect in software. Um, so a lot of contract law is really just about um, interpreting contracts where they're vague. So you'll often see uh, phrases in contracts that are like, you know, the party agrees to use all best efforts to complete their obligations. And like, how do you determine if someone has given their best effort, you know, programmatically? That's a very human determination. 
Um, furthermore, sometimes it's in people's best interest to renegotiate contracts. So if you go back to the bet example, you know, if BU and Northeastern don't both make it to the bean pot, the bet can't really go on, but maybe you still want to bet that, you know, Northeastern is going to beat Harvard and we'll change the bet so that it can still happen and everyone will be happy. Um, you can't really do that with a smart contract unless you've, you know, really coded it very carefully. And then finally, it can really conflict with the whole idea of law is law. Um, so there are sometimes cases where code is law, the code is actually in conflict with the law. And so who wins there? As some people will argue that code is law should supersede law. Um, I think most people would not. All right, so we're just going to go through a couple of case studies on some ethical questions that have come up in the blockchain industry in sort of recent times. Um, so this first one, I guess, will touch a little bit on this idea of code is law and smart contracts and the way that they can be um, abused, I guess, as well as some of the risks around immutability of um, the blockchain itself. So in October of 2022, there was a theft from a project that's called Mango Markets. Um, it was a, basically a platform for types of financial uh, speculation and an attacker was able to basically manipulate the value of the collateral that they had put on the platform which they then were able to use to take out basically massive loans from the project so you know they had this amount of collateral that was worth some amount of money they made the project basically believe that that collateral was worth quite a lot more than it actually was. And then they were able to take out loans against it, abandon the worthless collateral and make off with $116 million worth of various tokens. <clears throat> um, in this, this sort of large block of text here, the exploiter after they stole the money basically decided that they were gonna submit a proposal to the project. So the project was run as a DAO where basically all operations um, that were made by the project were decided by the members of that project by a like, uh, group vote. And the attacker submitted a governance proposal where they basically said, listen, I'll give you back, I think it was like 46 million of what I stole. I'll keep 70 million and you will agree not to prosecute me and you won't, um, try to freeze the assets, um, which basically means, you know, make it so that they can't withdraw. Um, the first vote didn't go through, but the second one did, which was uh, a slightly different monetary amount. So basically it, it reversed it where he gave 70 million back and uh, capped 47 million. And they were like, yep, all right, we agree. We won't prosecute you. We won't try to freeze these assets. But that kind of conflicts to some extent with law is law, um, where you know it doesn't really matter if Mango Markets decides to prosecute this guy or not, the government can still be like, there was a huge theft. And so um, ultimately, oh, I'll get to it in a second, but ultimately um, the person who had committed this theft was, you know, their identity was revealed. And there was this question of, are they gonna be facing legal trouble because they had basically entered into this agreement with the members of the DAO that there would be no prosecution. Um, the person who actually committed the theft, this is, this is them, they wrote this series of tweets that basically said, it was all legal, you know, the contracts allowed us to do what we did, and because there was this vulnerability in the contracts, we didn't break the law. Um, people who take code as law very literally would would agree with them that, yeah, there was a bug, they exploited the contract, they made off with a huge amount of money, and therefore they did nothing wrong. They were operating within the bounds of the contract. But I think a lot of people would argue that, you know, exploiting vulnerable code is, you know, still a crime to some extent if you're stealing assets from somebody. Um, and ultimately that is what the government decided. Um, so this person was charged with both criminal uh, uh, charges as well as civil charges from the SEC. Um, and the case is still ongoing. They're trying to, uh, they're sort of sorting it out at this point. But as you can see, there's sort of this ethical question there, which is like, okay, so to what extent do we say, you know, buyer beware, the contract is law and anything that happens within the bounds of that contract is, you know, acceptable within 
um, this project versus the sort of more traditional sense of like, okay, but they really did not intend to create a system where someone could make off with $116 million of treasury funds. Um, moving on to another example. Um, so going back to the privacy question, there are some issues with the fact that every transaction on the blockchain is public and traceable. And so there have been systems that were uh, introduced that allow people to kind of like launder their money to some extent on the blockchain. And I, that has a very negative connotation in terms of crime, but it was very much like if you wanted privacy, you had to launder your own money. Even if you were doing nothing wrong, you just had to sort of use these services in order to obfuscate where that money was coming from and going. And the way they work basically is there is this central uh, smart contract where people can put money into it and they basically get a private receipt. And then at some point in the future, they can get that money out of the smart contract to a new address. And because so many people are um, submitting quantities of money into this uh, smart contract and so many people are taking quantities out, it's very difficult to say that you know that 10 Ethereum that was put in is the same 10 Ethereum that was taken out by this person later on. And they use very consistent quantities so that you can't go and say, oh, it was 1.2587, you know, and, and sort of match that up with the output. Um, and so it is a very effective way of obfuscating the transfer of funds. Um, but there are some questions around this software. So is writing software like this ethical? You know, people would, I think people definitely do have very differing opinions on this. Some people have likened it to some extent to the crypto wars uh, from the 90s, which refers to the other type of crypto, cryptography, where there were challenges around whether or not you could, uh, you know, basically um, export encryption. You know, if you could write encryption algorithms and share them publicly, because the government was really worried that people would abuse them, because you can abuse encryption, right? Like you, you can put um you can use it to hide you know nefarious data in the same way that you can use it to make sure that no one's snooping on your web traffic and so people use it for different purposes and the question is you know what are the ethics of actually producing this type of code um in this case the u.s government decided that tornado cash this particular mixer was being used so heavily for criminal money laundering that um, they would sanction the smart contract, which itself was kind of a novel idea. Um, but the idea was that anyone who was transferring money to Tornado Cash or receiving money from Tornado Cash was, you know, basically in violation of these sanctions. Um, and that's not to say that everyone who had been doing that was a criminal. Many people were using it for perfectly legitimate reasons, but it was also being widely used by cybercrime groups to obfuscate the um, stolen funds. And it did also run into some weird implications where, like I said, if people were receiving money from Tornado Cash, they were considered to have interacted with a sanctioned entity, which is not something most people really want to end up doing. Um, but uh there were this there was sort of this i don't know how much of it was like people trolling versus people trying to make kind of a point but um if all your you know if the only thing that needs to happen for you to be in violation of these sanctions is to receive money from tornado cash there's nothing stopping someone from putting money into tornado cash and then sending it to a whole bunch of people and suddenly those people have interacted with a sanctioned entity and now they have to explain to the government that like it wasn't me i swear but like it's tornado cash so maybe it was they don't know and so someone ended up doing what became uh, referred to as dusting where they took very small amounts of ethereum and started sending them to well-known people. So like the CEO of Coinbase or Jimmy Fallon, the, you know, the, the TV guy, or like brands, you know, I think they sent it to like Puma. Um, some of these, you know, prominent crypto figures all received this money. And so then it was like, oh God, all right. So how do we actually deal with this? And, you know, they have to submit forms to the government now because they've just received money from a sanctioned entity. Um, and so there are actually some law, there are some lawsuits around this particular sanction where some people really strongly believe that, um, you know, there is no, Tornado did nothing wrong. This is a privacy service. And the fact that it is used for crime doesn't mean that everyone who is using it is a criminal. 
And so, you know, people are making arguments in the courts right now that the sanction is overbroad and that people should be allowed to basically use services that allow them to maintain privacy. There's also an issue around the person or one of the people who developed the software. So um, typically, you know, if you're writing code and someone takes that code and uses it for, uh, for you know, nefarious purpose, you are not held liable for that code, um, at least in the US. You know, there's sort of a broad belief in the US that code is speech. And so you are protected if you write code that is later used by somebody else to do something bad. Now, obviously, if you write code and you also commit a crime with that code, that's kind of a different thing. Um, but just writing the code is typically not um, considered to be criminal. But there is a developer of the Tornado Cash code who is facing criminal charges in the Netherlands right now. Um, and it's a little bit unclear to what extent the charges are based on the fact that he wrote the code, which was then used for you know, criminal purposes versus him actually profiting from the code. Um, there's, a, there's not actually that much clarity in terms of the lawsuit and what has been made public. Um, you know, Dutch authorities claim that he had all this crypto money and that he um, bought a Porsche and he had this really nice house and there's no way that he would have been able to do that, you know, to afford those things from his you know, day job pretty much. And so clearly he was profiting through running tornado cash relays, which is sort of how the service actually operates. And then as a result, you know, was indirectly profiting from crimes. <clears throat> um, there's also Dutch law is a little bit different from the US. Um, and so it's illegal basically to conceal or dis disguise the origin or movement of funds. Um, and so, you know, that is also sort of factoring into it. But there is this question around like, should you write code that can be used for nefarious purposes, even if it may also be used for very legitimate ones. I think that's something that a lot of software engineers who end up working in open source end up asking themselves. You know, there was um, there's been a handful of conversations, you know, both recently and historically around, you know, if you're writing open source code, what if someone you don't approve of uses that code? So I know there was like a while ago, um, some conversations around open source developers who realized that their code was being used by immigrations enforcement and they didn't approve of that. They didn't like how that was being used against people, um, but they had written the code, they had released it under an open source license and that was completely acceptable. Um, I know, especially recently with AI, there's some questions around open sourcing some of these AI um, software programs where, you know, could nefarious things happen if you do this? You know, could people use these large language models to do things that you don't approve of? Um, and in the case of the large language models, could you be held responsible for the output of those models? You know, people are sort of struggling with that at this point. Um, so these are really just two examples of some of the major ethical problems that come up. There's kind of an endless list of them. Um, you know, the fact that uh, people are sort of being asked to participate in a system that, you know, is based on speculation is a concern that a lot of people um, worry about, especially when it comes to, you know, encouraging children, for example, to participate here. So there have been, you know, NFT projects, for example, that have been somewhat geared towards children and people will argue that that is unethical because crypto is far too much like gambling and we should not be encouraging our children to gamble and you know there's all these different things. Um, so these are really just a couple of examples. Um, but at this point I wanted to just open it up to anyone who had any questions or you know anything that they wanted to discuss I'd be happy to answer. Don't all go at once. What's the positive case for it? Like, you're like, no, the good outweighs the bad. What's the positive case for it? Or do you just have to go like straight dystopian? Or do you have to go like straight dystopian where it's like, oh, the government's going to get your tornado your money? Yeah, I mean, so I will acknowledge that I have a bias here in yeah. that I am. 
Right. I am not the best person to sort of argue for the benefits of crypto. Um, generally speaking, you know, people will argue that the benefit of being able to transact outside of these centralized groups is, you know, good enough that that is outweighing all the bad. And so you, it's sort of like a risk that you have to accept to be able to have that kind of freedom. Um, you know, people, I think, I think there is a very accurate, um, understanding that we are subjected to quite a lot of financial surveillance these days. You know, your banks have access to all of your transactions. Governments can fairly easily get access to those transactions. And so it is very hard to pay somebody with, you know, anonymously. You have to get cash pretty much. And, you know, moving large sums of cash is quite difficult. Um, and so people will argue that there are very legitimate reasons that you just want to be able to, you know, have privacy and transact with people. And so the fact that crypto enables that, you know, is good to the point that all of the things that it also enables is like buyer beware. I mean, Jordan, I'm just saying that like, I'm bored. Who am I paying thousands of dollars? I'm like, I don't want it, but it's know, like. Yeah. It's a good question, but I, I think it also gets into some of the questions around um, just privacy in general. Like, you know, there's this idea of like, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, then what do you have to be afraid of? And, you know, I would argue that you still have the right to privacy, even if you're not doing anything wrong. Um, and, you know, the same thing can apply to financial transactions where it's like, I'm not doing anything wrong, but I just don't particularly want, you know, my government or my bank to be in my business all the time, you know? And then there's questions around, for example, like, you know, there are states where abortion is illegal right now. And so if you wanted to pay for, for an abortion, you know, people would, there are definitely plenty of people out there who would argue that, well, it is technically illegal, but morally acceptable to do that. And so how do you privately do that without, you know, running into problems there? Um, so there are a lot of these sort of gray area financial transactions that you might find yourself wanting to make and want to be able to potentially make in the future. Um, and so the argument there is that, you know, crypto could be a way of doing that. Although I would argue that, you know, public transaction history may not be the best place to pay for an abortion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't recall specifically if it was flash loans or not. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, and I think that's a great question. So, um, you know, personally, I think that a solution to a lot of this is just making sure that people understand what they're getting into. You know, like, I think if you want to speculate on like Shiba Inu, Elon Musk coin or whatever it is, you know, and you understand that like that could go to zero, that could be stolen tomorrow. And you're like, yes, I get it. I want to buy in. Like, you should be allowed to do that. I think that's fine. People like to do stuff like that. Um, the problem really arises when people don't understand that that's what they're doing. And I would say when companies or actors in the crypto space intentionally take advantage of the fact that people don't understand that. Um, and I think there is a problem as well where the level of um, understanding that people need to have and familiarity with not only you know, the code, they need to be able to read the smart contracts, they need to be able to understand all of the crazy financial engineering that is going into this, you know, they need to know whether or not they can trust the people behind the project in some cases, um, you know, there's a lot of research that you have to be able to do to really, you know, responsibly decide if you're going to engage with something like this, that, you know, the question somewhat becomes, you know, to what extent do we expect the average person to be able to do that? Um, and so, you know, when it comes to something like the stock market, you know, there is some level of regulation in play so that every person who wants to invest in the stock market doesn't necessarily have to understand the very detailed, you know, perspectives that these companies supply and things like that, but that they have, you know, past sort of a minimum level of responsibility and, you know, reliability that has been put in place. And so the question then becomes, do we want something like that with crypto? you know, what, to what extent do we want to try to protect consumers 
Um, and then, you know, does regulating things like this then basically sign off on it where it's like, oh, it's regulated. The government says you should buy it, you know, and then it's like, you know, questions around that. So I think the, the, the questions around, you know, buyer beware versus trying to protect consumers, you know, reasonable people can have very differing opinions on it. That's hard to say. Um, you know, I try not to make predictions about it just because it's so unpredictable. Things always go so much weirder than you expect. Um, things are definitely not as um, popular as they were in, like I said, late 2021, early 2022, and prices were really high. You know, Super Bowl commercials were telling people to buy crypto and to use these crypto exchanges. Um, you know, you were seeing news articles about how everyone and their grandma should be putting money into this stuff. Uh, that's definitely calmed down a little bit. And we've definitely seen a reduction in popularity of, you know, NFT trading volume and things like that. Um, but who's to say, you know, if it comes back again, I would say crypto is very cyclical. Um, and so it sort of goes through these periods where there's this mania, people get really excited, prices go up, people want to buy, you know, people see that prices went up. And so now they want to buy because they think they'll go up even more. Um, and then they come back down, people lose interest, you know, a period of time passes and then something else happens, you know, people come out with the term web three, which is very appealing to people. And then everyone gets interested and there's all these news articles about how web three is the future and people start buying in and it gets interesting again. So I'm, you know, I am expecting that cycle to continue, but it's hard to say to what heights, you know, that popularity will rise. <laughs> yeah, um, well, it's a little different. From, so I went to, you know, Northeastern for computer science. Um, I'm not doing a whole ton of computer science in my day to day these days, because I've been just writing a lot. Um, but, you know, I think being able to understand the technology that actually is, you know, in play here is definitely something that I learned at Northeastern, you know, learning about networks and learning about the way these systems operate. Um, and then, you know, taking a class like this one where, you know, I was asked to think about, you know, the fact that developing software can be, you know, it's not a neutral uh, action and you have to really consider, you know, whether or not the things that you're doing are having a good impact on the world or if there are, you know, negative externalities that you really ought to be thinking about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, personally, it's not something I choose to get involved with in terms of, you know, I don't work in that industry, I don't invest in cryptocurrency. Um, but, you know, I think that everyone should be able to sort of make their own decisions on that and determine, you know, some people really do believe that the benefits outweigh the costs. And, you know, if that's something that you can strongly um, back up, then I would say go for it. But, um, you know, I think the, the biggest advice I would have is really just to engage with tech criticism. Um, it's something I wish I had sort of learned more about sooner. Um, there is sort of a broad group of people who do the kind of work that I do now, which is really just looking at technologies, understanding the impacts that they have on the world, you know, trying not to view them in just a vacuum, um, trying to get past this idea that, you know, Silicon Valley or, or tech founders are just sort of these like morally good people who are just bringing innovation onto the world. And if anything bad happens, well, oops, you know, um, so just sort of understanding those, those types of, you know, questions and criticisms that are out there, I think can help people really just sort of embark on a career in a way that is more thoughtful, I think. Um, you know, even if you're, you know, not starting a company and you're working, you know, just as a junior software engineer, you know, I think it's still good to be able to feel confident that the work that you're doing is, you know, broadly helping people.
like you can make friends with those people again following this to some extent, um, that's definitely the narrative that I would say the crypto industry has been pushing, which is that like, look, these banks are so unstable, come put your Bitcoin, you know, buy Bitcoin, and then you don't have to worry about your bank collapsing and your deposits being unavailable to you. Um, I think there are flaws in that argument, you know, to some extent, I think most people don't have the kind of cash in their bank accounts that uh, they have to worry about being over depository uh, insurance. Uh, and to some extent, I think some of the arguments that people should be worried about that sort of betray um, the fact that it is often very wealthy people who are like, buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. Um, and then I think also, you know, the past year that we've had of collapses in the crypto industry just sort of don't make it seem like that much of a safer haven. You know, I think there are a lot of people who are like, oh, you know, I saw what happened with FTX. I saw what happened with Celsius and Voyager and all these other companies. Maybe I'll take my chances with Bank of America, you know, or whatever it is. Um, but I would say that the crypto industry is definitely pushing the, the idea that bank or that crypto is a safe haven. Um, from banks. And there are also these very um, political ideologies that get into play as well, where some people have this belief that, you know, the government is inflating our currency and it's, you know, ruining your savings that you've worked so hard for because they're just printing more cash. And well, with Bitcoin, you can't do that because there's only a fixed supply of Bitcoin. And so, you know, it's never going to inflate. Um, I don't really ascribe to that particular belief system, but you know there are definitely people who do see that as a strength of Bitcoin. Yeah, well, so something that I've always tried to do, you know, since beginning the project that I work on today is try to just absorb a wide variety of perspectives. Um, so, you know, even though I am very much on the critical side of the spectrum, I listen to a lot of, you know, pro crypto podcasts, I read a lot of crypto media, you know, I, I, I sort of absorb the things that the crypto industry is saying. And then, you know, I think about them and I try to, you know, come at them with some degree of skepticism, understanding that there is, you know, incentives in play here for the crypto industry to really puff things up and, and make claims that may not be true. Um, but, you know, just keeping in mind, like, why people even care about this to begin with, you know, like, why are there people who do believe that crypto is changing the world? I don't think everyone who believes that is like a dumb person, you know, or they're, they're wrong or anything. They just have a different perspective on it. And so understanding that perspective, I think, can be a really healthy way to sort of understand, you know, what the whole space is about. Um, and I think with large language models, it's kind of the same thing, you know, getting the really critical perspective, getting the moderate perspective, getting the people who think this is going to change the world, um, but understanding where they're coming from. You know, if someone is the CEO of a, you know, AI company, they probably have a vested interest in promoting this stuff. Um, so, you know, just sort of being savvy, I think, about what you're consuming and, and where it's coming from is, is pretty important as well. <laughs> uh, is anyone, does anyone here think they're going to go into the blockchain industry? I won't judge you. I promise I won't. Okay. I've been, I've been really interested to see how that's changed over the past year or so. Um, a lot more skeptics in the audience lately. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.
I don't know. Yeah, I think we got three. Well, I mean, it's funny enough. 